أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل تعالوا أتل ما حرم ربكم عليكم ألا تشركوا به شيئا ألا تشركوا به شيئا وبالوالدين إحسانا ولا تقتلوا أولادكم من إملاك. Respected uh, Chairman, my dear and sour brothers, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. We have just heard uh, a scholarly address by Qaid Sab Tarbiyat, and I'm uh, pleased that I share the same initials as he does, but I probably do not share the same eloquence that he has. Winston Churchill, the Prime Minister, was once asked by a member of Parliament as to when one should make a speech in Parliament, and he said, never. It is better for people to be asking why isn't he speaking than why is he speaking, and I hope that that is not the case in me today. Hazrat Hafiz Mukhtar Ahmad Saab Shah Jampuri, her companion of the Promised Messiah, was once approached by a father who was migrating to the West along with his, uh, with his family and requested him for prayers. Hafiz Saab turned to him and said, Suna hai wahan to nasle tabah ho jati hai. We have heard that progenies are destroyed there. It was a word of warning which unfortunately for that family came to fruition many years later. That was not the first family that succumbed to the West and nor will it be the last. This is the danger that we face living in the West. The proper upbringing of children here, be it here in the UK or any other Western country, is an important part of man's responsibility, but one that is not without its perils. Because along with wealth, children are a trial for us, according to the Holy Quran. The Holy Quran has preserved for us many prayers of prophets for righteous offspring. And this, of course, has to be the starting point in the upbringing of our children. Rabbi Habli Milla Dunka Zuriyatan Toyiban, Hazrat Zakaria Islam prayed. Or the prayer of Hazrat Ibrahim, Rabbi Habli Minaswalihin. But let me turn to the verse of Surah Al. Al-Anam that I recited, and the translation is, say, come, I will rehearse to you from your Lord what has been forbidden, that you associate nothing with him, and that you do good to parents, and that you do not kill your children for fear of poverty. The obligation we owe to our parents is, of course, clear from this verse and from many others. And we as Ansar probably are aware of that from a receiving end. And that is at the heart of a strong family unit, a matter that is important for the proper upbringing of the children. In this verse, or part of the verse that I recited, Allah commands, kill not your children. And one meaning of this is that by not giving them a good upbringing, we fail our children we cause their spiritual death, and we cause their moral death too. The proper upbringing of children in the UK is of course important because that's where we live. But when we look at it from the perspective of the warning that was given by the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam 1400 years ago, when he described the Dajjal of the latter days, and he said how his right eye would be blind, whereas his left eye would be very powerful in his vision. The right, of course, alluded to spirituality, and the left to materialism. And is that what we see in the West today, how the West has become spiritually dead, we are, while they have made great strides 
in materialism, and therefore we were warned not to follow the Dajjal, otherwise we would too become spiritually dead. Having lived here in the UK for well over half a century, like many others of you, we have seen the decline in the society in their moral fiber. It's disastrous. The number of people who deny the existence of God keeps on rising. Marriage is losing its importance. And those that marry, 50% of them end up in divorce. Close to half the babies are born outside of marriage. Same-sex relations and marriage is common. Alcoholism and drug use are prevalent as, crimes, uh, are, as are crimes involving guns and knives. Wife beating or battering, sexual crimes against children, and the list goes on and on. I have served in the Qatar here in the UK for 20 years. Each and every one of the vices that I have mentioned I have come across in one or other case that is a very sad statistic that I place before you. So the upbringing of our children here in the UK is an important subject and has to be done as a conjunction with their education, with their talim. A subject of talim and tarbiyat cannot be separated. The upbringing of children is a vast subject, but too often, we make the mistake of having a very narrow view of what is required. The upbringing requires parental love and attention, but this does not mean that you spoil them, but it means that you listen to them and you guide them. That guidance is more effective when it is with patience, whereas if you are rigid, if you are rigid in your approach, this ruins the whole purpose of your guidance. Your own attitude, your treatment towards your wife and your family members are very carefully noted by children, even very small children, and this has a negative influence upon them if that is lacking. What is the aim, one, you, one may ask, of the upbringing of our children? We want to make them decent human beings who are good for society, that they fulfill their obligations due not only to Allah, our Creator, but also to His creation. This, of course, as the Promised Messiah has explained, is Islam in a nutshell. So no matter whether we are dealing with the tarbiyat of our girls or boys, they have to be brought up with good manners, respect for others, be kind-hearted, have soft speech, and not be abusive. Their dealings should be honest, and they should be good neighbors. Islam is the perfect faith, and the Holy Prophet wasallam, is the most excellent exemplar. And this is from where we have to learn how to live our life. The tarbiyat, or proper upbringing, of the child begins from the time of birth although prayers are said even before, by calling the adhan in the ear of the child. Some fathers think that they have done their bit, that is the sum total of their efforts of the tarbiyat of that child. The truth is that tarbiyat of a child is a lifelong process, and this is the true jihad akbar Let me tell you that time, time is the greatest investment in the upbringing of children from both parents. And no amount of financial investment can ever replace the commodity of time. In families where the father is working long hours and perhaps the mother is out working too, this lack of attention becomes the greatest reason for why the child becomes misguided. In this materialistic world that we live in, we actually focus on materialism. Don't feel pressured to go out and buy that Mercedes or buy that four-bedroom house or buy that Armani suit. You should live within your means and be happy and content with what Allah has granted you. Our ladies should not feel pressured 
that they must go out and earn. So that the child, when the child returns, for instance, a parent should be at home to support the child. And if both parents are working, the children are left to their own devices. They are more likely to misbehave, and this results in the breakdown of that very strong family unit. Consider a typical day, and I'll give you some average figures. It is said that a child perhaps sleeps for 10 hours, can be away from the home for eight hours during a school, school day, which leaves only six hours. And it's said that out of this, children perhaps watch four hours of television a day. That would be fine if they were watching MTA all of that time. Sadly, not the case. So what are we left with? Two hours. That is important time that parents must utilize beneficently. You should definitely eat together, pray together, and you should not eat in front of the television, for instance, and you should share in their activities and make sure that they are always kept stimulated. Children often have models, role models, or personalities that they follow. Boys, for instance, will have sporting superstars, such as their interest in these superstars, that they will know everything about them. They will know Ronaldo what he had for breakfast. They'll know Ronaldo what car he drives. They'll know Ronaldo what haircut he had. They'll know Ronaldo what, what uh, are his sponsors. Whereas for us, the Holy Prophet وسلم, is the model to follow. And by teaching them and discussing the seerat, the life of the Holy Prophet وسلم, in depth, in great detail, they will aspire to this model and that is what will focus them towards this. The Jamaat, by the grace of Allah, has many good books on the Holy Prophet ﷺ Sirat, both in English and Urdu, and this is something that each and every family has to get to know. When I look around you, I see mainly grandparents and perhaps parents of older children, and for us, the most important thing in the tarbiyat of our children, as has been mentioned before, are our own examples. This will play the most effective role in the training tarbiyat of our children. What are those things? It is our closeness to Allah, our bond to Khilafat, our bond with the Jamaat, our bond with Ansarullah, and this is what will influence children greatly. If that connection is weak, on any aspect, then they will never have an impact upon the, whatever you say, they will disregard. So I cannot stress the fact that actions speak louder than words. Our salat is the means to gaining closeness to Allah, and we are constantly reminded about that. And even yesterday, as a focus, Hazrat Amir al Mu'mineen addressing Ansarullah UK in particular, brought this point to our attention once again, as he has done so on many a time. In the UK, we may not have mosques on every street corner. The Salat at home takes on added importance. If the child never sees his father offering his Salat, let alone leading the Salat in congregation at home, what chance is there that he or she will become a worshiper. Many households, unfortunately, have fallen into this trap and have become spiritually dead. Hazrat Amir al-Mu'mineen, Adiyyudullah Ta'ala bin Nasl Aziz once said, many people ask me to pray that their children be righteous. But when I ask them about their five times prayers, they say, we try to offer. This proves, just proves that their actions do not support their words. You may also have noted that some Ansar members do attend the Salat centers, but their grown-up children are never to be seen with them because the father has given their precedence of schoolwork or going out to play or playing with their mates precedence. This sends a wrong signal to the children and therefore they give no precedence to their Salat in that respect. It is the responsibility of each Nasser to assist such families with kindness, 
to support them, to, to win their hearts and to bring them back to the worship of Allah. But never be harsh in your approach. And you should always remember that one has to learn to crawl before you can run. If you push them to run before they crawl, then they will certainly fail. So teach them, first of all, the Salat. They should know the wordings of the Salat and the meaning of the Salat. Encourage them to say their prayers before insisting that they must come to the mosque. So this has to be done on a stage-wise process. Children definitely know the difference between what is nagging and what is advising. And we should always advise our children and not to nag them. The Holy Prophet وسلم, after all did say, take the middle way, take the middle way. The auxiliary organizations play a key role in promoting a close link with the Jamaat. But what can they do if when the Qaid organizes some activity, but the parents, they turn this down saying that they are busy in other things and activities of clubs outside the Jamaat. Or at times, parents insist that the transport for these functions must be provided by the Jamaat, whereas for other functions, they themselves take them to this. This sort of attitude rubs off on the children, and then they give the Jamaat no preference either. Ami Sab UK will vouch for this, and many of you will have heard him as I have heard him say, how parents have come to him now and expressed their remorse, saying how they regret that they kept their children away from the Jamaat programs and events, gave precedence to their worldly pursuits, and now the children have turned their back not only on the Jamaat, but on the family too. This is what happens in the end. But at the same time, remember that auxiliary organizations can only guide our children. A class may last one hour a week, whereas the tirbiyat, the rest of the tirbiyat, has to be undertaken in their homes. And you can teach children and you can avail every minute of the time that you have with them. For instance, if you're taking them on a car journey to school, then rather than putting the CD of Nusrat Fateh Ali or Adele or whoever you listen to, you should ask them to repeat the prayers, the Salat, the short Quranic prayers, so that they get into the habit that when they're going to sit in the car, this is what they're going to do, and that is great benefit to them. If you wish your children to be connected with Allah, then connect them with Khilafat. We in the UK are the envy of the world because Khilafat is within us, it is within easy reach. But we have MTA too. But what good is that if that is never tuned in our homes? As a must, the, min the Friday sermon has to be a must. And then there are other programs that will benefit the tarbiyat of our children on MTA. In our life today, the Khalifa is our model, a living model that we have in front of us. And we must come to know him closely. In a recent mulaqat, Hazur was asked, how can we connect our children with Khilafat? In reply, Hazur said he was, in reply he said, by making sure that they listen to the Friday sermon. And the second thing that Hazur said that I would like to share with you was by reading the diary of Abid Khan Sahib, the press secretary, a wonderful resource, and I urge you to access this device and to derive great benefit from it. And this was Hazu's advice to us. All ages of children are important, but perhaps none more so when they go to university. For the first time, children leave their homes. They find new friends. They have to fend for themselves. So what do universities do to ease them in? They arrange what's called Freshers' Week. Some of you may have heard of this. Some of you will have experienced this. But a major part of Refreshers Week involves around drinking. You can imagine a 17 or 18 year old, not fully mature, leaving his house and falling into this trap. And as more of our children follow university education, we need to be alert and to prepare to assist them 
by telling them to keep in company with the righteous. I can recall a long time ago, 1975, I joined UCL in London. I had no Muslim classmates. However, I had two Sikh friends. And every day after lectures and clinics, we would get together in a room for our tea. But when we got to the hostel, they would turn around to me and say, and they would say, Tu namaj bada, cha si bada So you know, that was best for me because I would go and say my Zohar and Nasr and also get out of making the tea, so they would do that. Bread and jam is all, the only thing that we could afford in those days. I'm aware that the world has changed and the children's best friend is their electronic gadget. We are all aware of the dangers of things like chat room, your face, your tube, and many others, and I perhaps you would never have heard of them. Gone are the days when we used to advise to have the computer in a room where the rest of the family was. The computer is now in their pocket. But however dependent upon the ages of the children, there still can be some effective control on their usage. If the child is not misusing the device, then he will have no qualms about sharing the password with the parents so that they can monitor what he is accessing. Now, even this society is realizing the dangers of these devices, and they're talking about something that's called detox. You should try this in your families too. For instance, when the, fa when the family gathers for a meal, all the phones are put into a, a receptacle, into a box, and they're kept in another part of the house. The same with when they go to bed. The phones are not by their bedside, but they're taken by the parents and they're kept away. The average person checks his phone every six and a half minutes. Some of you might be doing it just now. That is 200 times a day. An average teenager sends 3,400 electronic messages a month, and that is from their bedroom alone. So you can imagine that what would be the outcome of the overuse of these devices. The proper upbringing of children can be a rewarding task because then these children will be the delight of your eyes and then they will be well placed to, upbring, to bring up their children in the best way. Mr. Chairman, I hope that the matters I have touched upon prove to be of some use in the terbiyat of our children here in the UK. In summary, to deal with this subject, one must fully be aware of the issues and challenges before reforming our own lives and becoming a model for our children. Prayer, of course, is the start and end and be all of all of our efforts. Every wedding card, we, every wedding we attend, every wedding card perhaps we receive, the Quranic prayer from Surah Furqan, Rabbana hablana min azwajina, is written or the talawat is carried out. But we must question ourselves. Are these mere words of the Holy Quran that we, have, we are repeating? Or have we made any conscious effort to become a model of righteousness for those under our wing? We pray in every prayer, Rabbi Jalni Makaima Salate wa min zuriyati. My Lord, make me constant in prayer and my progeny. Do we follow that? For if we fail, then the outcome is that we lose our progenies. Majlis Ansarullah plays a key role in the tarbiyat of its members. And I'm aware that this is something that we need to focus on this subject more than any of the other activities of our auxiliary organization. I end by giving you the words of the of Hazrat Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ayyadullah Ta'ala bin Nasr aziz and of Hazrat Masih Ma'ud al-Salam in a short quote, Hazur said, along with prayers, parents should also be pure of thought and conduct. Sometimes mothers are more inclined towards faith than men, but both need to be pious and virtuous. The promised Messiah said, be virtuous yourself and present an excellent example of piety and taqwa for your children and strive to make them virtuous and pious. 
you should strive. This is the important part again. You should strive for this just as you strive to accumulate wealth. May Allah be our helper in this jihad.